Good evening. Welcome to the Chatham Marconi Speaker Series. My name is Liz McCart and I'm a volunteer here at the center. We are so pleased that you have joined us tonight and appreciate your support. As a reminder, you can pose your questions during the presentation by highlighting the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Type in your question and our presenter will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. We've all heard of autonomous or driverless cars. This same concept is being used in the maritime industry. Tonight, our speaker, Lauren Lamb, will explain how the technology is used and give a demonstration. It is my privilege to welcome our guest tonight, Lauren Lamb. A Boston native, Lauren grew up hearing stories of her father's US Coast Guard career. While in high school, she attended a STEM program at Massachusetts Maritime Academy and knew her career would follow in his footsteps. Lauren pursued a career at sea following her 2013 graduation from Mass Maritime. She went on to earn a Master of Science in Maritime Business Management from Mass Maritime in 2020. Congratulations, Lauren. Today, Captain Lauren Lamb is the Vessel Test Lead at Sea Machines Robotics. She tests the company's products for commercial vessels and provides recommendation from the mariner's perspective that make the technology easier to use and more intuitive. Captain Lamb is a founding member of the Northeast chapter of the Women's International Shipping and Trading Association, WISTA. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I'll now turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Liz. Hi, everyone. So as Liz said, my name is Lauren Lamb. And what I'm going to start off with today is a demonstration of our system. Uh, the reason I'm doing this this way is because our other captain, um, Captain Rick, who's on the vessel right now, I'll expand the, that's Captain Rick right there. Um, he's actually gracefully staying late for us so that we can do this presentation and I, um, I want to get him off the water as soon as possible. So I'm just going to give you a quick demonstration of how to use our system. So what you're looking at now is the user interface. It's the computer, the laptop that at you as the user would be planning missions on. The autonomy computer or the AC is a box that sits behind Captain Rick on the vessel. And this vessel is a 25 foot safe boat. It is autonomous, obviously, but it also can be driven manually. So you don't need to pick one or the other. It's obviously ready for a human. It, the system is ready to be retrofitted on any vessel. So you can, um, you can make this any vessel an autonomous boat. So on the right hand side, you see that we have a lot of vessel information here. We have the name of the vessel, which is steadfast. Uh, we have the mode, which is none right now because we're not in autonomy. When we do go into autonomy, that will change. And then we have the speed, the engine information, the gear that the engines are in, the heading, course over ground, position, and fuel information. So all of this information is coming in through the boat over 4G to me. I'm in my um, house in situate Massachusetts. So this is um, a remote operation that I'm doing right now. So Again, this is gonna be a really quick demonstration. Um, I, I recommend looking at our website for more in detailed demonstrations. But, um, so what we're gonna do today is create a mission. So I'm gonna to go to new right here and hit waypoint and survey mode. We also have a collaborative following mode, which requires two vessels. And you have a GPS radio beacon on the mothership or the first vessel. And then anywhere that I drag this daughter ship or follow vessel is going to be where we stay relative to the mothership. So if, if the mothership turns, we're going to turn. If it slows down, we're going to turn slow down. So that's used a lot for force multiplication, search and rescue, things like that. Um, we also have a lot of customers interested in that for surveys to do a really long survey and essentially half the time with half the crew. So we need two vessels on the water for that again. So we're just going to do a, a waypoint and survey mission today. So I'm going to hit create and then it brings up this mission parameters menu. So the first two things I'm going to type in is the mission leg speed and the mission turn speed. The leg speed is the speed at which 
all of the distance between the waypoints are going to go. The turn speed is the speed at which we're going to turn through each waypoint. So I'm going to turn, make that a little bit different so you can see the difference here. Then we have a couple options here. So really quickly, we have cross track error, which activates a really fine tuning parameter. This is used exclusively for survey vessels. So obviously for survey vessels, you want to stay right on the leg. It's really important for data collection. So they want to get a little bit more accuracy there. For mission auto repeat, instead of stopping at the last waypoint, it's going to go right back to the first waypoint and continue the mission forever until you manually abort. We have follow leg lines, which is um, how much priority is associated with staying on the leg line versus just getting to the next waypoint. So that's really important if you are deviating from course for whatever reason, mainly collision avoidance, and you're off course, the target's passed and clear, it makes the decision. If you have this checked, it's going to get back on track. And if you don't have this checked, it's going to get to the next waypoint it's in the, um, the quickest way. For depth avoidance, we actually have three behaviors. So we have depth avoidance slow down. And that is, it's going to take the depth, the minimum threshold that you've set as the user, and it's going to start slowing the boat down until it reaches that threshold. So when it reaches the threshold, it's going zero knots. Then we have another feature that we've specifically um, developed for survey companies, where they actually are surveying these areas. So they want to get to the lowest possible depth that they can, and they want to reverse out of that low depth area once they reach that threshold. So we've actually autonomized that for them as well. And that will reverse out once it hits that threshold and then go to ne the next waypoint if it can and just keep doing that. The depth safety area is instead of taking the, the real time depth information like the above two behaviors do, it takes the depth contours of the chart. So you can see behind the menu, we have these contours here. And it's gonna create a safety area around the mission that the vessel is going to stay into and into the, the area. So if we got too close to that, that boundary um, for mainly, again, collision avoidance, if we're deviating from course, it's going to try to push us off of it and keep us within that safe area. The last one here is sea keeping. Sea keeping is used for um, reducing the stresses of the vessel, um, comfort of the crew, safety of the cargo, and that uses our IMU, so the roll, pitch, and heave of the vessel, and it's going to slow the boat down if it senses that those thresholds have been exceeded. So I'm going to hit OK, and then we have this one other menu that pops up, and that's collision avoidance. So for collision avoidance, we use ARPA and AIS, um, which you'll see today during the demonstration um, that we're going to use an ARPA target. And we have four options here. We have off altogether, which means that if you have the radar on, you have the AIS on, You'll still see those targets, but you won't avoid them, obviously. And then we have three different thresholds. So you see, again, behind the menu, we have this blue ring around the vessel. That's a manual, or that's a visual um, indication for the user that this is what's in my zone here. So you can make that 500 meters, 1,000 meters, or 2,000 meters. The 1,000 and 2,000 are more for open ocean environments. Where we are right now, I'll show you, is... Um, an area called Quincy Bay in Boston Harbor. I'll zoom out a little bit and show you the lovely chart of Boston. So what you're seeing here, where my cursor is, this is Logan Airport. Our office is actually right here. So you can see Captain Rick is down here, about five miles south of the office in Quincy Bay. So I'm gonna zoom back in. Sometimes there's a little bit of a lag on Zoom and Teams, so excuse that. And now that I've clicked through, picked all the mission parameters, you can see that I have mission tools here. I'm in point mode, which means that anywhere that I double click, it's going to be a waypoint. So I'll create a couple waypoints and then I'll create a survey grid. So I clicked grid on the right hand side here and I can put in grid parameters. So this is that lawn mower pattern that you'd, be, you'd see for a survey grid um, or a survey mission. And I'll zoom in to show you what that looks like. And there's nothing different about these waypoints than the ones I dropped previously. This is just a less manual way to draw that. So you can put in these parameters. Um, as some of you probably know, survey grids can be very long and very tedious. So this is just a less manual way that you have to drop all the waypoints. So after this one here, I'm going to make a little bit of a long leg here. And that's going to be our collision avoidance leg. So we're going to do collision avoidance off of this 
off of this piece of land here. And the reason we do that is because we make it a point not to play chicken with any commercial targets in Boston. So we don't want to scare the crap out of anyone in the harbor that's just trying to do their job. So when we do demonstrate collision avoidance and when we test collision avoidance, we use our own vessels. So we try to hit each other. We don't actually try to scare the crap out of everybody else. So I'm going to hit deploy if Captain Rick is ready. Got the thumbs up. Captain Rick is ready. And I'm going to hit deploy. So a couple things are going to happen. Captain Rick is going to step out of the driver's seat so you know that we're not cheating, which is pretty much the only reason why we have this camera in the cabin here. We also have these bow and stern cameras, but it's a little bit dark, so you can't see too, too much. And we're on our way. So you saw that the mode up here on the top right changed to waypoint mode. You see the speeds changing. The engine gear is now in forward. We have RPMs that are higher than idle. And we're getting onto this first waypoint. So as we do this, at the bottom right, we're going to see mission timers appear. And the mission timers are going to be the time to the next waypoint. Here we go here. And the total mission time. So it will show you um, what, what we have net left in the mission. So while we do this, um, we also have the ability to pause the mission. So if I pause this mission right here, the boat's going to pause. The mode's going to change to pause. The engines will go into neutral again. You see at the top right, the speed's going to go to zero and we're just gonna be drifting. So Rick can actually take control if he wanted to right now and drive around. And then as, so, as, long as, as long as he puts the vessel back in neutral, the engine's in neutral, we can resume the mission and it will just get back on track. So I'll zoom in a little bit and show you what that looks like. It's a little bit rough out there. So we actually did deviate from core. So that's, that'll be good. The other thing we can do here is dynamically edit the mission. So if I go again into mission tools here, go into edit, we can change any of these parameters that we've previously set. So we can turn on and off any of these behaviors. We can change the default turn speed and leg speed, and we can turn off collision avoidance if we wanted to as well. Once we click through those menus, we can actually move edit and delete waypoints. So I can actually Maybe move this waypoint a little bit forward and play with this mission a little bit. If I go into edit, I can change the speed of the mission or speed of that leg, I'm sorry. So if I bump this up to eight knots here, maybe bump the speed for the turns up to six knots, oops, up to six knots, only for this leg will that happen. So you can do this on a per leg basis. So delete this waypoint too for fun. And as soon as I hit save, I'll tell you what that menu means in a, or that warning means in a second. But you can see that this time in the, on the bottom has adjusted and our new mission time is 11 minutes instead of the 14. The warning message that I clicked through is for danger checking. So it's telling us that the current position of the vessel is not checked for dangers. The mission is checked for dangers. So that's just telling me that just beware, check your surroundings. Not as important with dynamic edits because you know you're really close to the mission. But um, if you were to plan a new mission on the other side of an island or uh, whatever, or beacon or whatever, um, it's just telling you to beware. So I'll show you a little bit of the danger checking here. So I'm going to click through these menus one more time and make a terrible decision with this waypoint. So if I were to sit, hit save right here, it's gonna tell me that I'm crossing a low depth area. And that's because of that bound, that safety, that safety area that we, that we set at the beginning, which is this thick blue line. So obviously we're crossing this threshold, so it's not gonna let me save this mission. It's not gonna let me run it. Um, I'd have to either move or delete this waypoint in order to run this mission and to save it again. So if I delete it, hit save again, it's gonna redraw that that bounding area, you see that, that it stopped highlighting this one right here, and then it's good to save. We also have this status page here. This is where a lot of the information would be. This is a demo vessel, so a lot of it isn't hooked up, 
but we have the gear temperature, oil pressure, all the engine information. We have the roll, pitch, and heave from the IMU right here. We can start and stop the engines from here. We can turn on and off the nav lights and any other payloads that you have specific to your vessel. So you see we have a lot of the, the standard ones for, for boats and, and ships, but we also have these user configurable ones. So any input and output that you have um, that you want to control autonomously, you can do so. So normally in the summer on this boat, we have a fire pump that we, we attach to one of these payloads and, um, and energize it when we're doing demos so we can demonstrate that that as well. We also have the ability to turn on and off the AIS and ARPA sensors. Down here, sorry to move the zoom page. Down here, we have chart tools. So the track right here is just this, this black lines, the breadcrumbs that you see. So I can turn that off and clear it and then turn it back on. We also have themes because obviously boats don't just run during the day. So we have the, the brightness themes for the user interface. And then we have an, an A to B measuring tool. So anywhere that I click, it'll give me the point, the position of each point, the distance, and then the bearing of those two points. In the chart tools here at the top, we have these two icons. This first one is a chart marker. So anywhere that I wanna drop a marker, that's obviously um, whatever you would need a marker for. If you wanna um, tell the Coast Guard that you saw a disabled buoy or a disabled vessel or something, you could drop a little marker here. It would give you the latitude and longitude. If you right clicked here, it would give you the range and bearing from you to the vessel. And then we also have a standard maritime man overboard button. So that does generally the same thing, but instead of picking the location of this marker, it's gonna drop it directly on the vessel wherever you were when you press the button. So that's, that's a pretty standard thing for electronic charts and radars um, and multifunctional displays to have um, a man overboard button and it does the same thing. If you click through it, it will tell you the latitude and longitude and then it will tell you the range and bearing. This is gonna be a little bit of a sharp turn. Maybe we'll activate the sea keeping. The other thing I should mention is this vessel is tuned specifically for the vessel. So when we do um, outfit a, a boat with our, one of our systems, we have a tuning process. So we don't have default parameters that we set um, for rudder angle, for acceleration, and deceleration. We, we take the vessel's characteristics and we, turn, we tune them per vessel. So you can see that we're, we're really close to the, the waypoints. We're following the, the leg lines really closely. And that would be the same for uh, a 50 foot boat for a 70 foot boat because it's going to be tuned specifically for that vessel. It's not going to be um, like a cookie cutter uh, set of parameters. In the bottom here, we have the alert panel, which is where you would see if you had any dangers, if you had any loss of communication, any GPS dropouts, all of the, the alarms that go with um, those things. We also have this little gear. Um, icon in the bottom right, and that is our alarm configuration page. Again, we have a lot of user configurable alarms. So we have the ability to just like kind of blank alarms that if you, you need a particular piece of equipment um, monitored, you could do so. And then if you scroll down, we have the general alarms that you would see on a vessel. So we have batteries and fuel tanks and um, check engine, uh, high oil pressure, high oil temp, things like that. Uh, the cool thing about this is we can not only turn the alarms on and off, so you can just make one of the alarms not trigger, but you can also change the value at which it starts to trigger. So I always use the example if you're not on the vessel and you're operating remotely, you'd probably want to know a lot sooner than 15% that you were low on fuel. You'd want to know at like 50. So you'd want to change that parameter and bump it up a little bit. So you get that early warning. So that's something that you can configure as the user. So we're about to get onto our last waypoint here, and this is gonna be our collision avoidance leg. So a little bit about our system and our behaviors. So what we do is everything's based off of a priority. So 
the priority to follow the waypoints and follow the leg lines up until this point right here has been 100% because there's nothing else going on. There's no collision avoidance. There's no depth threats. There's no seat keeping. There's nothing. So it's staying as close as possible to these turns and to these legs. As soon as something gets within this 500 meter threshold, the collision avoidance priority goes to not zero. So it doesn't mean that we're going to freak out and you know, drive out of the way of something that's stationary and not moving towards us and not gaining any distance on us. It's just going to alert the user that something's up, something's in our zone, and we will avoid it if we need to. So you can see this little green circle here is an ARPA target. This just popped up. We're in range of this beacon here on this piece of land. So as soon as this gets within our 500 meter zone, um, it's going to alert the user by having a, a little line, a range line, and then it's going to have a, um, we call it a toast message, but it's a flashing message at the top that tells us the collision avoidance is active. And this, the closer this gets, the faster it's going, the closer the closest point of approach is or the CPA is, that's when the priority goes higher and higher. And then the way following the track line gets lower and lower. So that's when we start to deviate from course. So you'll see that right now. So you see that we, and I'll shut up for a little bit so you can, you can focus on it, but you can see that we are not technically avoiding. We're still on track. We're still doing our thing, but we will start to alter course because we are getting closer to it, obviously, and this isn't going to get out of our way. So we're going to make that decision to, to bow out a little bit and go around it, which is what we're kind of doing right here. So in addition to the 500 meter zone here that you can visibly see, we have a 100 meter zone that's invisible to the user, but it's always active. So what that does is it makes sure that if something gets within 100 meters, the collision avoidance priority goes to 100%. So it's not going to gracefully get out of the way. It's going to get out of the way as quickly and as safely as possible. So what we call, we call that our in extremis um, parameter. And that's something that we take directly from the rules of the roads. You can see that collision avoidance notification said coal regs, which is the collision avoidance regulations for, for seagoers. And that is, gives us some guidelines on how we avoid collisions. And what this one is saying is, if somebody is not doing what they're doing, supposed to be doing, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and a collision's imminent, you have the responsibility to do more and get out of the way. So that's what that 100 meter ring is for. So you see we're getting a little, well, not quite yet, but we, you see we're kind of going back to the course now. That's because we have that follow leg line enabled and we'll be getting back on course and getting to this next waypoint within, I guess, two minutes. So a little bit about, I kind of skipped over Captain Rick here. Captain Rick is a fellow Mariner. Uh, we both have a lot of maritime experience. He has over 20 years in the industry. He's been on tugs, he's been on yachts, you name it. So what he does is he brings a lot of the voice of the maritime industry to sea machines and make sure, again, as Liz said, that when we are testing this product, we're not testing it as software engineers, we're testing it as people that would actually use it in the field um, and it's intuitive and it's, it's useful and it's something that people are gonna to want to use. So that's, that's kind of our job. And we get to take the software that developers spend countless hours developing and try to break the crap out of it, which is not the worst job in the world. So, especially in the summer. So thank you, Captain Rick, for staying. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna be getting to this waypoint in about 40 seconds. Then what you'll see in the top right, you'll see that the mode's gonna disappear. And oh, we picked up that little thing again. The mode's gonna go to none and the engines are gonna go back to neutral. This mission on the, the chart is going to disappear and then we'll be ready for the next mission that we wanna plan. So that's, that is just about it.
wait for the mission to end and then I'll switch gears to my, my slides. All right. All right, thanks, Captain Rick. So, now a little bit about sea machines and then the science behind what I just showed you. So, sea machines was founded in, oops, sorry. Sea machines was founded in 2015 by Michael Johnson who was a VP at Crowley. At the time, he went to Texas A&M, um, failed for a little bit, but then ultimately came shoreside. Um, he was also at Titan Salvage, which is the company that was, um, he was one of the project managers for the Costa Concordia, the writing of the Costa Concordia. So when he was in Italy, he saw that there were so many close calls. He was on the coast a lot. He was looking at um, the, the, the waterways like near the Costa Concordia, and he was he was wondering why there isn't a better solution to the maritime worlds. There's there's self-driving cars that are being developed. There's trains. There's everything. Um, so Lauren, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're not seeing your slides. Oh, you're not? No. Oh, hold on. No, I'm glad you did. Sorry. That's okay. I think you have to share again. Yeah. Technology, you know? All right. Can you see these? Yeah, there we are. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you. I didn't get too far. So um, thank you for that. So, so yeah, so he, he got home from that and he decided to start Sea Machines. And um, his goal was to just make the autonomous world or the maritime world safer and more predictable. So we have two offices. We have the East Boston one that I showed you on the chart. And then we have an office in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, we also have two commercial products that are on the market now with a third one being developed, which I'll talk about very soon. It's very exciting. And we are one of the, the biggest industry leaders in the autonomous space. So we have a real product. We have something that's been tested. It's, it's BV certified. And um, not a lot of other people can, can say that. We have a lot of our competitors that do commercial autonomous vessels, but they're vessels that humans can't be on. So sail drone, things like that, where it's either an autonomous vessel or it's not. There aren't a lot of retrofitting autonomous companies like we are. So, so it's very cool. Uh, the two, just like in cars, there's levels of autonomy for, for ships. Um, and those were set by the IMO. What we, we focus on are the two that are highlighted in yellow. So the, the low automation, which is all actions are taken by humans, but they're guided in their decision making by all the data that's available to them based off an autonomous system. Um, and they can support decision options um, and recommend things. The second one, which is the one that you just saw, is the high automation. So that's decisions and actions are performed autonomously with human supervision. Um, there's, this allows for humans to intervene and override if they need to. But as you saw, collision avoidance does not need human inter intervention, things like that. So that's the second level of, of the automation that we're looking at. Um, another big thing, people get really nervous when people say autonomous ships. They think that everyone's going to be blown off ships and fired and ships are going to be going across the Atlantic with nobody on board. That's not what we're doing at all. Autonomy does not mean unmanned. It's just increased situational awareness. It's just increasing the predictability of ships. So the three products that we will have by the end of the year. So the two that we currently have are the SM200 and the SM300. The SM200 is a remote helm. So you can see it's literally a belt. It's called the belt pack. And it turns any boat into basically a big remote control toy. So it has, the vessel has an antenna on it. You can be about a thousand meters away and remotely operate the boat. So what we use this for a lot is approaching. So approaching docks, appro uh, we had one of our customers this morning um, belt pack onto a trailer to, to take the boat out of the water. Um, we also use this as like the first and last leg of autonomy. So if you had an autonomous vessel in a mother that you were deploying off of a mothership, you're not going to start a mission right there alongside. So you'd kind of move the vessel away and then move it back when you're ready to, to bring it back on board. 
And that's what we use that for. The SM300 is the one that I just showed you. So that's where you have the chart, you can see in this picture in the middle, we have the cameras, we have collision avoidance, we have all of the, the behaviors that I explained to you. And then we have the person in the loop, like what I would be in this situation. The 400, the SM400, I think we actually changed the name of it to SM360, but don't tell anyone I told you that. So that one is going to be full situational awareness with camera detection, sensor fusion. Uh, it's going to take AAS, ARPA, camera, infrared, and it's going to fuse targets and give you as much information as humanly possible. So that's, that's for the bigger ships. That's just going to be a, a tool for the, the Mariner to use on board. So this is what that, that remote helm looks like, the belt pack that uh, the man in the previous picture was wearing. This is the user interface. This is on an actual laptop. Uh, you can just do it on, like I'm on my personal computer right now. And then the, the big um, box in the back, that is the autonomous computer, so the, the AC. So this, again, is the brains of the system. This is where all of the computations is done. So as soon as I hit deploy in that mission um, that we just did, all of the calculations is done here. So we actually don't need to be connected to the boat at all at, after that point. Uh, we do have safety measures in, in place where if it didn't get communication from the laptop for a certain amount of time, which is user configurable, it would automatically abort the mission, but it actually doesn't need the input from the user. That's just the window into the system so the user knows what's going on. So it's more of a comfort thing for the, for the, the mariners. And again, it's situational awareness. So you can see in this illustration, we have the, the communication coming from a satellite. We have the information where the, the depth areas are, where the, the land is, where the buoys are, and then where the ship is based off of radar, ARPA, AIS, cameras. So we're just taking everything that is already available to mariners, putting it in one place and making decisions based off of it. So a lot of the words that you'll see and hear when you talk to sea machines or hear about sea machines is predictability, optimization, productivity, reliability, situational awareness, and safety. Safety is a really big one for us. We want to make sure that the system is something that people trust and people are comfortable with it, which is why they've, they've put a lot of effort into hiring mariners and people like me to make sure that it's not just the software product that nobody can use because it's too complicated. Um, but it's also effective. So it does the same thing every time. You're not going to get any crazy erratic behaviors. And, and that's what we, we spend a lot of time testing. I think we have over 5,000 hours on the vessels that we have testing. We have another vessel on the way actually in, in the summer. And we're growing our test fleet and our test program as much as possible because it's a huge priority for us. Um, our other goals for this year is to get regulatory approval. Um, for all of our products, that will be the, the new product that we have to be BV certified. The other two already are. Um, and then again, just the testing and the, the validation um, is very, very big and very important for sea machines. So again, a little illustration. If you had, um, if you follow the right hand side, you have the command or the master or the mate of the vessel, you have direct control and you have the throttle and steering and direct switching. The C machines computer takes dynamic steering and dynamic throttle. So what's it using? It's not saying I want to go seven knots. I'm just going to go what I think would be seven knots and call it a day. It's going to take the wind and the current and um, it's going to adjust to make sure that we're going seven knots all the time. So that's dynamic steering and dynamic throttle. It's always going to adjust itself to make sure we're optimizing our route. And then we also have the ability again to be a regular non-autonomous vessel. So we always have the steering, the throttle, and the switching. So we always have the ability to take con manual control of the vessel in an emergency. This is just a little illustration, again, of the, the autonomous box here, the autonomous computer. And it's taking the information from the engines, from the propellers, or the Z drives, or whatever you have for propulsion. Um, it's taking the wireless communication either by satellite or 4G. We have both and it has the compass, the radar, the, the GPS, and then any cameras that you have on board. 
So it's taking all of that information in and then spitting it back out to the user in one place. So this is our office in Boston. This is remote commands. We have a control room there. So if I was in the office today, this is where I would be doing this demo. Um, and we have a radio, we have everything that you would see here. And you can split the screen and do the cameras and um, the chart and everything and deploy missions remotely. So this is again, I think we're actually using 4G here, but we also have satellite capabilities um, on our vessel to do from this office as well. And this is what we picture. I have another picture of one of our customers using something similar. This is what we picture people using for our remote offices. So if you had survey vessels or dredging vessels and you were the person in charge and you wanted to check in on multiple vessels, you could have this split screen um, situation here and, and look, look in upon um, multiple vessels at once. So a lot of the value of autonomous systems comes from the workboat industry. So what we consider vessels with jobs, not, um, not so much at this time, the container ships and the tankers and stuff like that, but we're talking ferries and support vessels and defense and um, dredge survey, things like that. So you can see the, the pros and cons or the pros of all of those different industries and you can see, obviously, there's a lot of buzzwords, the productivity, the pre predictability, safety is in every single one of them. Again, um, that's something that we, we strive to, to perfect. And you can see there's a lot of different uses and a lot of different improvements that we can make upon all these different industries here. So the workboat application, again, is where we're targeting right now. So you can see we have the tugs, fireboats, dredges, um, aquaculture, surveying, and search and rescue. So we actually have, I think, a customer with all of these right now. So we're, we're in all of these spaces at this time. And then again, as promised, so this is one of our customers deep, and this is a survey company in the Netherlands. And this is what their control room looks like here. So this was a picture that they sent us before we integrated with them so that they knew kind of what they so we knew what they wanted, what they were looking to improve upon. So they have, again, all their software survey equipment um, and data coming in. And then currently they have our user interface on that top right screen. So that's something that they can do from their office. And this, this survey vessel here runs completely autonomously in the Netherlands. This is actually a pretty outdated picture because we are in spring of 2021. So we do have a lot more vessels out there in the wild, but this is a little indication of our glo global footprint and the vessels that we have currently out there um, working autonomously and testing our system for us, helping us test our system. And then also um, doing data collection. So you see this bottom right picture, the MERSC container ship. Um, that's the Vistula MERSC and it runs in, in Russia and it helps us with data collection. So it's, it has a bunch of cameras on board their system. It has the beta version of our SM400, our new, our new product. And it is collecting ship data so that we can classify and identify when what ships are what. So we can, we can optimize our collision avoidance and our identification. So this is our SM400. This is going to be eventually embedded into the 300. So it's going to be part of both products, but the 400 will be its own strictly situational awareness, like I said, um, like what we would have on the Maersk vessel. And this is what it looks like. This is an actual picture from the Maersk vessel. So this is the tug that's, a, that's, um, that's guiding it through this port. And you see we've, we've boxed the, the different targets. We have all this information here. So it's kind of small to see, but it has all the AIS information. So the name of the vessel, the MMSI, the speed. Um, and then you can see these right hand and left hand boxes here are what sensors it's using to identify. So we have AIS, ARPA, radar, and infrared. And you can see like this one only has the three. You can see in the background here, this one has four. And it's going to tell you what sensors it's using to bring in that information. This is another picture from the, the Vistula Maersk, and this is what it looks like on their, on their bridge. So they have four screens that are, or, I'm sorry, five screens that are stitched together. 
and it's integrated with their AIS. So you can see way off in the distance, it's identifying something, it's boxing that, that something, and then it's telling you based off the AIS, the range and bearing that it has from the camera, the range and bearing it has from the AIS, what that vessel actually is. So it's just taking all that information, stitching it together. And then one last picture for everyone. This is another, um, a little bit more cartoonized version of the same picture um, or the same concept where you would have the, the classifications that are different in this one. So this is what we're working on. This is why we're using a lot of data collection right now so that we can tell the difference between a ferry and a sailboat and a workboat so that we can do collision avoidance based off of the actual type of vessel and not just that there's something in the water, don't hit it. Um, so that's our goal by the end of this year. We're really close. We're, we're doing great things um, with identification and classification. We have a lot of great engineers on the perception team. And um, this, is, this is getting there. So um, we're excited for the SM400 to, to launch at the end of this year. And then this is a picture for, from us at um, MSRC, which is an oral response company, when we outfitted one of their vessels. And then the guy next to me here, this is Michael Johnson. He's the CEO. And that's all I have. Oh, thank you, Lauren. That was, uh, as one of our viewers has already typed in the question and answer box, fascinating. So thank yeah, you very glad. much for, for that presentation. And we do already have questions. And I would like to um, invite our audience that if you do have a question, type it in the Q&A and, and Lauren will get to the as many as she can. Um, so um, actually, there's a recent maritime incident that's on everybody's mind that we have a couple of questions that happen, happen to do with the Suez Canal. Um, and if um, the question is, if this system was on board um, the Ever Given, would, would uh, that catastrophe have been prevented? So that's, that's a good question. Um, and for that one, I'm not entirely sure because I think one, the Suez Canal is probably one of the most surveyed places in the world. So they, they know, the, they know the, the depths of that area. I think, well, I actually have a friend that was on board one of the ships behind them and I heard they lost power. So I don't know if our system would have prevented that from happening. If it was just like the bank effect, which is another story that's out there right now, um, we definitely would have steered away from the low depth area or the bounding, the, the depth safety area. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that the pilot has a lot, like the information that we have, you know, they're experts in that, in that area. So if it wasn't a human error mistake, I don't know if we could have prevented it, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you may have answered this question, but Ron would like to know, is this a fully customized software that your firm develops um, or you customize an existing software? So we developed the whole thing. So we have this product, the SM300 that you get as the customer. So a lot of the, the alarm configuration things and the, the buttons that you see, those can be a little bit customizable depending on what you are. Like we have a lot of customers that are survey. So you saw that I said survey a lot during that demo. We've developed, developed a lot specifically for that industry because we didn't have a lot that besides the grid mode that would help them um, or do what they do manually. So to answer the question in a shorter way, it's, it's not customizable in the software itself, like we, we're not taking something and adjusting it, but we can alter things specifically for the customer, like the tuning process and, and, and the alarms and things like that, the, out, the input outputs, um, things like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim would like to know, um, what organizations will you need to get certification from? So I guess another way to ask that is what, how, what in, what organizations regulate this business? So the, kind, the cool thing about Sea Machines right now is nobody is actually doing that right now. So what we're trying to do is get ahead of it. So we've been talking a lot to the Coast Guard. Coast Guard is going to be someone who at least has to inspect these vessels. I don't know if they're going to regulate it specifically, but 
Um, they're definitely going to be changing the licensure of mariners that deal with autonomous vessels, either as an endorsement or a separate license altogether, like, like DP uh, or dynamic positioning. But we have gone through BV, Brennan's Veritas, and there's also like the classification societies like AB, ABS and Lloyd's that do that. So we've been talking to ABS a lot. Um, they're all in the very beginning phases where they don't really know what they're looking for. So we're hoping to help them with that so that we don't have to backpedal and we can kind of be the, the, the guinea pig for them um, and help them develop the regulations. Um, but the IMO talks about autonomous vessels all the time. Um, you can look at their meeting minutes online to see like where they are. They just came out with those levels of autonomy last year, I think March of last year. So it's maritime ministry, as everyone probably knows, it's very slow moving. Um, but we're targeting the classification societies and the Coast Guard at this time. Okay, great. Um, Peter, who is an amateur radio operator, because I see his call sign W1OR, uh, would like to know um, if the communication link between you and the vessel is secured with encryption to prevent hacking? So this is one of the most popular questions we get asked. Um, Cybersecurity is huge, obviously. Um, so we, it is, yes. So it's encrypted. We have a VPN um, that is secure. Uh, we also do a lot of third-party like penetration tests to make sure that our system is, is as secure as it can be. Um, and we do a lot of government contracts. So they obviously are on us to do do those things as well. So, so yes, it is secure. Okay. And Liz, a viewer, would like to know what happens when the bottom is different from the chart? So I assume that's if there's some difference in um, or the charts aren't updated. Yeah. And so that's why we use both the, the real depth, like depth from a depth sounder or phenometer. And then we use the contours of the chart. So the contours of a chart are usually in mean, low, or low water, which means it's like the worst case scenario, the lowest it will possibly be for you. Um, so if we did it solely based off of that, obviously some areas aren't surveyed very often, so that could be super wrong. And then also you wouldn't be able to operate in a lot of areas that you totally would be safe in, but it would be telling you that you don't have enough water. So the depth safety area that we use is usually a little bit less um, stringent. So we put that depth at like two meters and then we put the depth sounder threshold at like eight meters so that you have those two levels of defense and you're not going to hit them at the same time. Sounds like the conservative way to go on all your parameters is, is <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Safety. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, Liz also has another question because this seems to happen to everybody. What happens when the GPS signal is lost? So we have um, a lot of fail safes in our system where number one, the biggest thing that when I came to this company, a lot of the things that bothered me were things would happen on the, the user interface and the user wouldn't know why. So they'd be like, oh yeah, that's because we lost GPS. I'm like, yeah, you have to like tell somebody that. Like you have to put that in the alert <laughs> section or like show it somehow because no one's gonna look back at the logs like an engineer would. So um, if you lost the GPS, you get the alert that says that you lost the GPS. If you don't get an accurate GP or an updated GPS message in I think five seconds, it's going to abort the mission. And it's gonna tell you that it aborted because it doesn't have an accurate position. And that's just because it doesn't know where it is, so it's not going to just drive autonomously blind. Well, that's good news. <laughs> um, do you, so Dave has a question on how does this vary from the technology used for autonomous autos? So it's really similar. Um, the biggest thing with us is we have a really dynamic industry. So ships come at, at you at every which ways. We don't have lines. We don't have stop signs to adhere to. So the, the classification of targets, which is what we're using a lot now and we're talking about a lot now with the perception and the camera detection is being, um, is a lot more difficult than in cars because you have a lot more variation, right? You have um, a lot higher ranges that you have to worry about. Um, whereas with cars, you really have to worry about only what's a hundred or a couple hundred feet in front of you. Uh, in ships, we're talking miles and miles. So that's the biggest difference there is the classification. Um, 
And then otherwise with, with vessels, obviously we had to change the way we control things. So as I said earlier, when you have a mission or a course, and then you're getting blown off by the wind, it needs to adjust in a car. You don't really have that problem. You're steering, you're going to go straight. Um, so we have that dynamic, that dynamic bottom that we have to worry about and, and the, the motions of the ship. To follow that, Mark has a question about how does the system integrate with drawbridges and other movable structures that require permission to proceed? Great question. So what we're doing now, and there's a lot of questions that aren't answered yet because we're, it's a new space. It's a new technology in the space or not a new space, but autonomy is a new, new in the space. So we're, we're targeting workboat and um, service vessels because they're generally operating in a controlled environment. So we're not talking about air drafts at this point. We're not talking about drawbridges and things. Um, we would have that as a perception target, so we would avoid it. I don't know right this second if we would know to go under it, if we, know, if we would know that we were low enough to go under it. Um, but that's, that, those are the questions that we, we ask ourselves all the time and, and try to figure out solutions to, but I don't think we've gotten a solution to that one yet. Okay. Maureen would like to know, um, does this help avoid collisions with whales? Another very popular question. Um, so anything that's on the camera and on the, um, well, on ARPA, but that's, that would be tricky, um, is going to be avoided. So we would, we would be able to avoid. We also, um, we have like the, the whale, um, sorry, can you guys hear me? My screen just went black. Yes, we can. We can oh, okay. for you. Yep. Um, so we have the the right whale zones where you have to go a certain speed limit. So the, the mariners would have to adhere to that. Um, but honestly, I've been on a ship that got real close to hitting a whale and there's not a lot that a human can do. I mean, it's hard for humans to see unless they're, unless you see it really, really far in advance. If it's really close to you, um, there's not a lot that a ship's going to do to, to avoid it, unfortunately. So, but yeah, if it's, if it's in the water and it doesn't look like water, which whales usually don't, um, the, the perception system is going to pick it up and it's going to classify it as a target. That's amazing. <laughs> um, one viewer would like to um, have you explain a little bit on what you envision a decade from now. How prevalent will some of this be for commercial vessels and recreational vessels? What's the future? So... I think that for at least open ocean transit, I'm not talking about ports yet, um, but maybe in a decade there will be. Um, I think that everything's going to be autonomous. I don't see why. I mean, if you, if you look at the maritime industry now, no one can tell you that it doesn't need an improvement. Like ships hit each other in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, nothing else around all the time. So I think that to take that human error out of the, the mix, I think ships are going to all be driving autonomously and they're all going to be able to talk to each other. So they're all going to know the intentions of the other ships um, remotely. Um, for I also think there is going to be some level of auto docking, um, autonomous ferries, autonomous um, like coastal transits for, for ship, for um, cargo, things like that. Um, I do think there's going to be, I don't think mariners are going to go away at all, um, like completely, but I do think there's going to be a lot of pressure taken off of the captains. Um, there's going to be a lot of, a lot less sitting there staring out the window, a lot more, um, you know, active, active work doing the logs and the paperwork and the, the cargo inspections and things that mates are already tasked with now, in addition to their, their, watching abilities and duties. So um, that's a good question. I think, I think autonomy is going to be huge in 10 years. I don't, I don't see it going away. I think it's going to be really prevalent in the maritime industry. It sounds like the role of the captain changes to some extent then. Yeah. And so I was in the Gulf of Mexico for five years 
before this and I was a dynamic, dynamic positioning officer. And I think when we arrived at drill ships and rigs, I think, and this was in 2016, I think we had 11 logs, 11 check, checklists and paperwork reports that we had to fill out and send to the rig before we could get within 500 meters of the rig. And that was on top of setting up dynamic positioning and doing the, the fuel reports and the actual navigation and everything. So just taking one component out of that for the, for the mariner and they can just know that something's always watching it. It's not getting tired and distracted and they can do their other duties is going to be huge. And that paperwork aspect is not going away. It's going to get worse. I'm sure it's already worse from my experience. Um, my husband's a mariner and, and uh, he actually just left today for a car carrier and his turnover notes for 20 pages long of the different reports and the different things that they have to do. Um, so just taking that one navigational aspect away, I think is going to be huge in the safety of the vessel and the, and the crew. That sounds like that's good news for, for, for the crew in terms of uh, reducing a routine sort of uh, task and uh, using their skills more specialized. Um, we're going to get in one more question for you. Um, Ron would like to know, uh, do you work with agencies to perform search and rescue ops? So we have, um, we've outfitted a Coast Guard vessel and then we have um, government contracts that we can't talk about. Um, the search and rescue aspect of it is really um, prominent in the Coast Guard, as you can imagine. Um, I don't know if they've actually used the vessel for that right now. They use it a lot for patrolling. Um, but what we need to do to improve for the search and rescue is the camera detection. Um, Cause obviously an autonomous vessel that's doing search and rescue isn't super important if you can't see literally everything that's out in front of you. So what we've done with them is we not only have the cameras, but we have a LIDAR on board, um, which isn't super great for normal ships because the range of the LIDARs are so, it's so small that you should, like, should have already been avoiding things way before you detect them. But for search and rescue, it's really big. So um, that's what we're working with the Coast Guard with. And they, they just did a, a demo with their vessel in Hawaii. Um, they're from the research and development team in New London, but they, they traveled to Hawaii and we, we um, put our system on one of their boats out there. That's great. That's uh, amazing work. And um, um, we'll be interested to follow um, what you're doing and, and how that uh, impacts the, the maritime industry. Um, so we want to thank you very much and thank Captain Rick for taking uh, time this evening to explain all this to us. It's fascinating. Um, so as a small token of our appreciation, we will be mailing you a Chatham Marconi Maritime Center mug. Um, and uh, we'll get that off to you and uh, uh, wish you well. So, um, and I want to thank all of our participants and viewers for all the questions uh, and for joining us tonight. Uh, so thank you again. Good night. Yeah. Thank you everyone so much. Really appreciate it. And thanks Liz. You're welcome.